Hi friends, uh, welcome to Navka Digital Institute, India's first virtual learning platform for professional coaching. Friends, uh, I believe we, we understand the importance of RTPs, MTPs and past papers. I mean, they carry a lot of weightage. Actually, they are useful from two perspectives. Number one, it gives you an idea about trend and specifically when you refer last five attempts, RTPs and MTPs and past papers, you understand the trend in which the questions are going to come in your exam. And more important, after preparation, when you solve RTP, MTBs and past papers, it boosts your confidence. Because RTP, MTB and past papers are the ideal papers or rather the actual papers uh, which have been either asked in exam or has been released by ICI that they are something, this is something which is what they are going to ask in your exams. But you know friends, where the problem is, like they have released one of the RTP in May 18. Now when May 20 students are referring those RTPs, the point is, what about the amendments? What about the changes? What about the components which has been modified? You know, in, in India, a lot of faculties have released lectures of RTP May 18, but they have recorded that at that time when RTP of May 18 actually was issued by ICI. Friends, that's where Navkar, the NDI, is taking an initiative. What we are doing is, respective RTPs and MTPs, we are amending as per the relevant attempt and now we are in process of releasing the amended RTPs and MTPs. So today, when in June 20, I am recording the RTP, I am obviously recording RTP of May 20, but I am also recording RTP of May 18 as amended for June 20 attempt or let's say as amended for November 20 attempt. So I hope you understand the importance of amended RTPs and MTPs and for that, you can rely only on one institute and that is NDI, which is Navka Digital Institute. Yes, friends, we are the only one who is providing amended RTPs and MTPs for your attempt. So stay with us, stay home, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you and God bless you. Hello, my dear friends. So friends. We are done with discussion about mock test paper of March 2018. Now let's spend some good time on discussion about mock test paper for April 2018. Something very interesting. So we'll spend some good time and become perfect. An interesting thing, what I observed in this mock test paper is that there are some good number of questions which are very similar to what we have done in RTP. And two, three questions are identical. Identical means as it is what we have done already. Those kind of questions are not waste your time, but whatever are similar, those questions will definitely solve once again so as to become perfect. Clear? Let's start. And of course, you will not find your multiple choice questions because this is an old paper. First question. First question. Sudhir Works Limited, Gurgaon, Haryana is a supplier of machinery used for making electric motors. Supply of machinery is affected as under, come on my dear friends, supply of machinery is affected as under wholesale price of machine excluding all taxes, wholesale price of machine excluding all taxes and other expenses at which it is supplied in the ordinary course of business is 21 lakhs. However, actual price at which machine is supplied to an individual customer varies within the range of plus or minus 10%. Sir, this kind of language, I already taught you, my dear friends. Especially this kind of language I taught you when I discussed RTP May 2020, where we had one multiple choice questions related to this kind of concepts. See now, apart from price, Sudhir Works charges the customer the following incidental expenses. Number one, associated handling and loading charges, 5,000. Weighing charges, 10,000. Installation and commissioning charges 40,000. Exactly. Then, machinery can be dismantled. Machinery can be what, sir? Dismantled and erected at another site if required. Above charges are compulsorily levied in case of every supply of machine. Next line. Next line, friends. Come on, see that? Transportation of machinery to customer's premises is arranged by Sudhir Works Limited through a third party service provider GTA through a third party GTA that is being arranged and customer enters into a this word is important customers enter into a separate service contract 
Customer enters into a separate service contract with GTA and pays the freight directly to it. So when customer is paying freight directly to GTA, that will not be included in the value of supply for Sudhir Works Limited. So whatever customer is paying to GTA is not included in the value of supply for Sudhir Works Limited. Getting clarity friends? Good. One year free warranty. One year free warranty is provided for the machine by the company. However, an extended two year warranty is also provided by the company on payment of additional charge of 1,50,000. Very good. Cash discount of 2% on price of the machine is offered at the time of supply. If customer agrees to make payment within 15 days of receipt of machinery, it is premises. Then, in the event of failure to make payment within stipulated time, company recovers. What will company do, sir? Company will recover. They will recover the discount given. Company recovers what may difference discount given. And they will also charge interest at the rate of 1% per month or part of the month. They will charge interest at the rate of 1% per month or part of the month on total amount due from customer from the date of making supply till the date of making payment. However, no interest is charged on the tax dues. No interest is charged on the tax dues. Then for every missionary supply, Sudhir Works Limited receives a grant of 1 lakh rupees from its holding company Randir Limited. Then Sudhir Works Limited has supplied a machinery to Durga Private Limited on September 1st. Very good. At a price of 20 lakh rupees. So 20 lakhs is the basic price of machine. Then Durga Private Limited has its corporate office in Noida, UP. However, machinery has been installed at its manufacturing unit located in New Delhi. And when we talk about installed like this, my dear friends, place of supply will become New Delhi. I repeat one more time, place of supply will become New Delhi, my dear friends, because of a wonderful section called Section 10 1 D which says in case of goods assembled or installed at site I repeat one more time what is the language my dear friends in case of goods assembled or installed at site in case of goods assembled or installed at site place of supply will be place of supply will be the place where goods are assembled or installed so technically in this particular case answer will become New Delhi then Durga Private Limited has paid freight directly to GTA. Very good. And after for two years warranty. Discounted 2% was given to Durga Private Limited as it agreed to make payment within 15 days. However, they paid the consideration on 30th November. That means what? They paid after 15 days. And I clearly told you that if they make the payment after 15 days, what will happen my dear friends? Number one, the discount given will be recovered. Conference. What is number one? Number one is discount given will be recovered. Number two, interest will be charged at the rate of 1% per month or part thereof. And interest will be charged at 1% per month or part thereof on amount due from customer. Clear friends? What is the rate of tax, my dear friends? Machine is 12%. Transportation of goods is 5%. But of course, this is not relevant for us because customer is entering into a separate contract with GTA. So for that customer is only concerned. Sudhir Works Limited is not concerned. Other services, 9-9 nine, 9-9-18 nine, 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 it should be actually. But one point very clear, let me tell you my dear friends. This is a case of composite supply. Come on. Supply of machine along with Supply of machine along with ancillary services is a composite supply. I repeat one more time. Supply of machine along with ancillary services is a composite supply. 
as per definition given by as per definition given by section 230 my dear friends friends getting clarity guys supply of machine along with ancillary services is a composite supply as per definition given by section 230 clear right next as per section 8a i repeat one more time as per which section my dear friends as per section 8a as per section 8a composite supply is taxed composite supply is taxed at the rate of principal supply composite supply is taxed at the rate of what my dear friends principal supply that is machine because in our case machine is the principal supply and for machine my dear friends rate of gst is what my dear friends 12 percent that is what we will apply in this case clear friends come on tell me now what is the price of machine sir come on friends what is the price of machine price of machine is nothing but 20 lakhs and for this 20 lakhs what all we had handling charges 5000 weighing charges 10000 installation charges 40000 handling charges 5000 handling charges 5000 loading charges 10000 handling charges 5000 what else was there weighing charges 10000 weighing charges 10000 installation charges 40000 come on weighing charges 10000 installation charges 40000 along with that there is something called two years warranty also what is that for extended warranty extended warranty you have to pay 1 lakh 50000 1 lakh 50000 clear friends extended warranty 1 lakh 50000 extended warranty 1 lakh 50000 then there was something called grant from holding company what is the grant we got my dear friends we got a grant of 1 lakh so what is total figure my dear friends 20 lakhs 15 55 60 20 lakhs plus 5000 plus 10000 plus 40000 plus what else was there 150 and 1 lakh total is coming to 5 lakhs 5000 my dear friends sorry it's not 2 lakhs right it is 20 lakhs right exactly 20 lakhs plus 5000 plus 10000 plus 40000 plus 150000 plus 1 lakh it's coming to 23 lakhs 5000 23 lakhs 5000 my dear friends on this 23 lakhs 5000 my dear friends apart from that we have got discounted 2% but 2% is on basic price so 2% on 20 lakhs which comes to 40000 So my figure turns out to twenty two lakhs sixty five thousand. Clear, my dear friends. On this twenty two lakhs sixty five thousand, if I calculate my on this twenty two lakhs sixty five thousand, my dear friends, 
if I calculate my IGST liability, sir, what I'll get is 22,65,000 into 12%. Clear, friends? Come on. 22,65,000 into 22,65,000 into 12%. This is coming to 22,65,000 into 12%. This is coming to 2,71,800. This becomes my GST payable. 2,71,800. Correct, my dear friends. This becomes IGST liability for September month. Correct or not, my dear friends? But interesting point to be observed in the question is that in the month of November, in November month, something has happened. What is that something has happened? Something what has happened is that discount is recovered. What is the value of discount recovered, my dear friends? 40,000. Apart from that, interest is to be charged at the rate of 1% per month or part thereof. For how many months? September, October, November. Totally for 3 months on what, my dear friends? On amount due from customer. What is the amount due from customer? 23,5,000 is due totally. But out of that 23,5,000, 1 lakh is basically grant from holding company. So balance what is due from customer is only 22,5,000. 22,5,000. 22,5,000 into 1% into 3 months. This comes to 66,150. How much it comes to my dear friend? 66,150. That becomes the interest. And the reason interest is being charged very clearly is that they clearly told in the question if customer does not make payment within 15 days, then what will happen? Number one, discount will be recovered. Number two, interest will be charged. And interest will be charged at the rate of 1% per month or part thereof on total amount due from customer. So, what is total figure is? Total figure is. 1,6150 and if I calculate my IGST liability on this how much it comes to is 1,6150 into 12 by 112 and the reason we do 12 by 112 is because any interest any interest or late fees or penalty charged by supplier from recipient is always treated as inclusive of GST. I repeat one more time, any interest or late fee or penalty collected by supplier from recipient, any interest or late fee or penalty collected by supplier from recipient is always treated as inclusive of GST. Clear friends? So 1,6150, 1,6150, into 12 divided by 112. That is coming to how much, my dear friends? 11,373.21. So I'll take it as 11,373. Come on, friends. So IGST liability will become 11,373. That's it. A wonderful question and high possibility that these kind of questions can come in exam. But what is most important is that. What is most important is that you present the answer very properly in the exam. If you just throw the answer just like that, marks will not come. So it is very, very important that you present the answer properly. Best manner you present, you will get some amazing numbers. No doubt about it. Clear with this point, everybody? Speak out. Wonderful. That is the story of this first, my dear friends. The story of this first question. Very, very interesting. Come on. BB2C. Answer the following question in light of place of supply provisions contained in IGST Act. So, question is basically asking you to find out place of supply. Interesting. See now. Quick Deal Enterprises, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Come on. See now. Quick Deal Enterprises, Ahmedabad, Gujarat opens a new branch office. At Hisar, Haryana, it purchases what, my dear friends, a building for office from 
Rouhani builders hisar along with pre-installed office furnitures and fixtures. Determine place of supply of pre-installed office furnitures and fixtures. Obviously, they are not ask place of supply for land or building because as per section 72A, read with schedule 3, on sale of land and building, GST will not apply because sale of land and building is neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service. That means on the GST will not apply. But for office furniture and fixtures, GST will apply. But it is already a pre-installed. Pre-installed means it is a case where I have to apply one section called section 10.1c which deals with place of supply in case where there is no movement of goods. Place of supply in case where there is what my difference? No movement of goods. And what law told very clearly is that in case where there is no movement of goods, place of supply will be location of goods at the time of delivery. Place of supply is what sir? Location of goods at the time of delivery to the recipient. I repeat one more time. Place of supply will be, I repeat one more time sir. Place of supply will be location of goods. Place of supply will be location of goods at the time of delivery to the recipient. If you observe here carefully, where is the location of goods at the time of delivery? Location of goods is in Hisar, Haryana. So automatically, my dear friends, place of supply will become Hisar, Haryana, my dear friends. That's it. That is the story of this wonderful question. Clear? Second bit. Supra events. I repeat one more time. What is that my point, my dear friends? Supra events. An event management company at New Delhi organizes an award function. So for organizing an event, we have got one section called Section 127 of IGST Act, which clearly says that if receiver is a registered person, then place of supply will be location of such person. And if receiver is an unregistered person, place of supply will be the place where event is actually held and moreover if event is held outside India event is held where my dear friends outside India if event is held outside India place of supply will be location of recipient but see now the organized award function for Chirag Diamond Merchants of Varanasi registered in UP at Mumbai event is in Mumbai but Chirag Diamond Merchants are registered where UP and for organizing an event, law always told uh, if a receiver is a registered person, place of supply will be location of such person. Where is the registered? UP. So place of supply will become what my dear friends? UP. And they are asking the question, what will your answer be different if award function is organized at Mauritius instead of Mumbai? Even though it is organized in Mauritius, still my answer is, still my answer is UP only my dear friends. UP only. The reason being very clear that in case of organizing an event, if receiver is a registered person, then place of supply will be location of such person. No doubt about it. And if receiver is an unregistered person, then only we look at something called place where event is actually held. And then we have one more point there. If event is held outside India, then location of recipient. Clear? Chalo. Come on, see, see bit now. Subramanyam Enterprises, an importer from Cochin, imports goods from exporter in US. Vessel carrying goods reaches Mumbai port first, and from there, and from there, goods are transshipped to Cochin port. Actually, goods came where first? Goods came to Mumbai port first, and from Mumbai port, goods are transshipped to where, sir? Cochin port. And an interesting point is that we will consider only those expenses and those costs incurred till the time goods reach. Otherwise, we will incur, we will consider only those costs incurred till the time of delivery at the time and place of importation. Delivery at the time and place of importation. Otherwise, we will consider only that cost. We will consider only that cost, whatever is incurred till the time goods reach India for a delivery at the time and place of importation. Clear my difference? 
Speak out, sir. So up to place of import only, whatever is incurred, that is only considered. After importation, whatever is incurred, that is not considered, my dear friends. Clear, sir? Next slide. Cost of machine, we'll consider this. Transport charge from factory to port, add this. Handling charges for paid, paid for loading the machine, add this. Buying commission is always ignored because I told you that commission and brokerage will add except buying commission. Freight charges from, for, from exporting country to India, this will add after FOB. Actual insurance charges not ascertainable. So what will you do? We will take 1.125%. Then charges for designing and engineering work undertaken for machine in US, this will definitely add. Sir, engineering work, design work, development work, art work, we will always include only if it is undertaken outside India. If it is undertaken in India, we will not include that. Clear friends? Then, unloading and handling charges paid at the place of importation. At the place of importation, this is not considered because we will consider only that expenses and cost incurred till the time goods reach India. Delivery up to the place of importation. At the place of importation is not considered. Then transport charge from Mumbai to Cochin port. This is also not considered. Exchange rate will take into account. They only ask to find out accessible value. Accessible value is nothing but CIF. Correct friends? Come on. Cost of machine. $10,000 Transport charges from factory to port $500 Handling charges $50 Clear? Yes, come on Transport charges From Factory to port $500. How many dollars, my dear friends? $500. Then, loading charges $50. Apart from this, what else we have? Buying commission will not add. Freight charges will add after FOB. Insurance after FOB. Design charges we should add now only. Sir, any adjustments to be done? We will do the adjustments before FOB stage only. After FOB, what should come is only Two figures, number one, insurance, number two, freight. Only these two will come after FOB stage. Restore will come before FOB stage only, my dear friends. Only two things will come after FOB stage, that is insurance and freight. Come on, $2,500 is what, my dear friends? Design charges. Total, my dear friends, $13,050. How many dollars? $13,050. To this, I will add insurance. What percent? One point, this is basically my FOB figure. 1.125 percent. 13050 into 1.125 percent. This is coming to 146.8125. So I'll take it as 146.81. We'll take only two decimals. Clear, friends? Come on. So what is the figure then? 146.81. Then freight. How much, my dear friends? How much was the freight? thousand dollars now don't tell me sir please apply the concept of 20 percent of fob i will not apply that concept because that concept will come only in two cases number one if right is not ascertainable we will take 20 percent of fob number two number two come on my dear friends first case is a case where if right is not ascertainable we will take 20 percent of fob case number two in case where goods are imported by air goods are imported by air then actual freight is restricted to actual freight is restricted to 20% of FOB. So freight from exporting country to India, I'll straight away take it as thousand dollars. I will not apply the story of 
20% because it's coming by vessel. So 14,000, 196.81 dollars into 60 per dollar. Therefore, assessable value in INR 14196.81 14196.81 into 60 per dollar this is coming to 8,51,808.6 since it is 808.6 I'll take it as 809 8518098 so my accessible value will becomes 851 809 that becomes my accessible value clear my difference that is the story of this wonderful first question my dear friends very very simple and easy i'm sure we got full clarity guys good come on friends let's look at the second question now royal manufacturers a registered supplier of machinery supplied a special purpose machine to dharam furnishers for which it charges a price of 9 lakh rupees. Very good. Further, it charges the following additional amounts. So, one point keep in mind, my dear friends. In value of supply, we have got one brilliant section called Section 15.2c, which says anything charged by supplier, anything charged by supplier from the recipient will be included in the value of supply. So, transit insurance will include, packing charges will include, extra charges for designing machine, that will also be include. And freight is something like a transport charges. And that is also obviously included, my dear friends. And always, my dear friends, please understand one point very clearly. Here, this is a case where there is a composite supply. What is composite supply here? Composite supply is nothing but Composite nothing but machine is being given along with that transport facility also is being given. I repeat one more time machine is being given and along with that machine transport facility also is being given. Clear friends? Wherein the principal supply is what? Machine. And will charge at the rate of machine only. So you know, cash discount at 2% of the price of machine is allowed to Durham furnishers. GST rate 18%. Compute value of supply. Simple question actually. Very simple question. Come on. Basic price how much sir? 9 lakhs. First of all, in the given case, in the given case, it is a, in the given case, it is a composite supply. In the given case, it is a composite supply involving in the given case, it is a composite supply involving supply of machine and other services and other services such as transit insurance, transit insurance and freight. Come on, my dear friends. In the given case, it is what supply, my dear friends? It is clearly a composite supply involving supply of machine and other services such as transit, insurance, and what, my dear friends? Freight. Friends, getting clarity, everybody? So speak out. Exactly. Then, come on. So, friends, in the given case, it is a composite supply involving supply of machine and other services such as what my dear friends transit insurance and what and nothing but freight my dear friends clear so when I start solving the problem how do I start I will first start with price of machine what is my price of machine come on price of machine is 9 lakhs price of machine is 9 lakhs Price of machine is 9 lakh rupees. Then, to that 9 lakh rupees, I will also add transit insurance. 
16,500. Freight, how much is freight, my dear friends? 18,000. Freight is 18,000. Freight is 18,000. Come on. Freight is 18,000. And after that, packing charges. And we also had design charges. Come on, how much is packing and design? Packing is 13,500, design is 30,000. 13,500, and this is 30,000. And these two are included. Packing and design, these two are included because of provisions of section 15.2c. Because 15.2c clearly says that. 15.2c clearly says that anything charged by supplier from recipient shall be included in the value of supply. Getting full clarity, friends. And moreover, interesting point you have to observe here is that composite supply is taxed. Composite supply is taxed at the rate of Principal supply. Come on, my dear friends. Composite supply is taxed at what, my dear friends? Composite supply is taxed at the rate of principal supply. Clear or not? Yes, come on. So, what is total figure then? 9 lakhs plus 16,500. 9 lakhs plus 16,500 plus 18,000 plus 13,500 plus 30,000. Total is coming to 9,78,000. 9,78,000. And from that I have to reduce the discount also. Less discount. And this discount is being reduced because of section 15.3a. Because 15.3a clearly says discount recorded in the invoice. Discount recorded in the invoice that is always reduced my dear friends. Cash discount, what rate sir? 2%. Correct or not? 2% on what? 2% on 9 lakhs, which comes to 18,000. So, discount figure is 2% on 9 lakhs, which comes to 18,000. So, my balance figure is 9 lakhs 60,000. This becomes my value of supply. That's it. Getting clarity, friends? Very, very simple and easy question. And at CA final level, if this kind of question come, it means that we are very lucky for that attempt. That we got so simple and easy questions, which are very, very scoring. Come on. Moving forward. Sorabji, a registered supplier, supplies following goods and services for construction of buildings and complex. Excavators. So this kind of question we have done. Already two times we have done. Come on. But still, Let's look at that in two minutes. Manpower for operation of excavators at per day rate. Soil testing and seismic evaluation at per sample rate. Excavators are invariably hired out along with operators. That means what? It is clearly a composite supply. Where principal supply is, it is clearly a composite supply where principal supply is hiring of excavators. Hiring of what, my dear friends? Excavators. Now see, Sorabji receives following services. What services they receive, sir? Number one, annual maintenance service for excavators. Number two, health insurance. Number three, scientific and technical consultancy. Now, for a given month, exclusive of GST, Sorabji Receipts are as follows. Hiring charges. Very good. On this we will pay GST at what rate sir? Hiring of excavator 12%. Manpower is 18%. But still we will apply 12% only. Manpower also 12% only. Because it is a composite supply. Which will be always taxed at the rate of principal supply. I taught this point to you sir. Not now. Long back I taught this. Same question we solved. For soil testing service charges we will apply 18%. Then, GST paid during the said month on service received by Sorabji. 
annual maintenance what will you do claim input tax credit health insurance no itc because it is blocked under section 17 phi next scientific and technical consultancy for soil testing and seismic evaluation on this also claim input tax credit that's it so this question i am not telling this kind of question this question only we solved and i hope that you remember this we solved that see it explain with reference to customs act conditions to be fulfilled for filing application before settlement commission i am not interested to talk because from customs syllabus penalties prosecution advance ruling settlement commission all these chapters have been removed from the syllabus so there is no point of spending time on all those things clear friends very good next come on looking at the next question my dear friends third question super engineering works limited is a registered supplier engaged in expert maintenance and repair services for large power plants that are in immovable that are in the nature of immovable property situated all over india friends this question we solved when i taught you rtp my dear friends where i clearly told you if you see the bottom i think you will recollect if you remember i told this question truck sent to a client location truck sent to karnataka i clearly told you this point where i explained this to you very clearly that interstate movement of interstate movement of various modes of conveyance between distinct persons i repeat one more time interstate movement of what my dear friends interstate movement of various modes of conveyance between distinct persons interstate movement of various modes of conveyance between distinct persons is neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service that means on the value of the truck gst will not apply but on the value of the goods gst will apply and moreover for the truck if any repairs is carried out for the repairs also gst will apply this question as it is i discuss with you chalo what was that truck sent to own location in karnataka value of items in the truck on these items gst will apply on value of the truck no gst because it is neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service whenever there is a interstate movement of conveyance interstate movement of various modes of conveyance between distinct persons not to someone else next truck sent to a client location in karnataka for carrying out repairs stand alone machine is also sent in the truck to client location for repairs value of the items contained in the truck value of stand alone machine value of the truck billing for repairs to be done afterwards depending upon the items used one thing you have to understand is that gst will apply only on the bill for repairs so whatever bill is given for repairs on that bill only my dear friends gst will apply on other things gst will not apply clear friends next truck sent to a client location in tamil nadu truck sent to a client location in tamil nadu for carrying out what my dear friends repairs value of items contained in the truck 556000 and value of the truck 30 56000 and billing for repairs to be done afterwards so if it is afterwards pay gst on afterwards only because gst will come only on the value of repairs then invoices raised for repair work carried out in karnataka on this definitely gst will apply no doubt about it next invoice for repair work carried out in tamil nadu on this also gst will apply but if it's a different state we will charge igst same state will charge cgst and sgst that's it this question we already completed my dear friends sir we this question came already two times before we already discussed this question when we have done the discussion about rtps earlier that time we have solved this question my dear friends and to clarify once again further my dear friends to clarify once again further 
what i am trying to tell you is that interstate movement of interstate movement of various modes of conveyance interstate movement of what sir various modes of conveyance between distinct persons between distinct persons is neither regarded as is neither regarded as supply of goods nor supply of service come on my dear friends very interesting and wonderful point come on what is this point talk about my dear friends interstate movement of what movement interstate movement of various modes of conveyance various modes of conveyance between distinct persons between distinct persons is neither regarded as supply of goods nor regarded as supply of service that means on this gst will not apply that is value of conveyance that is the value of truck or value of vehicle is not subject to gst full stop however gst would apply gst would apply on the goods or if any repairs is done for such conveyance any repairs is done for such conveyance that's it on this principle that question is completely based my dear friends interesting concept and i hope this is very clear for all of you guys clear make sense done let me proceed be with my dear friends come on see that an interesting point please see prarambh private limited or prarambh limited maharashtra provides support services to foreign customers in relation to procuring goods from china company identifies the prospective vendor reviews the quality and pricing and then shares the vendor details with the foreign customers so basically if you observe they are trying to provide some services called intermediary services and that too they are giving to a foreign customer so for intermediary services we have got one section called section 138 which says that place of supply will be location of supplier it is very important first of all in the question to identify to identify what is the nature of service that is important if that you are clear rest all you can do easily foreign customer then directly places purchase order on the indian vendor for purchase of specified goods prarambh prarambh limited charges its foreign customer cost plus 10% markup for service provided by it for the month of june company charge 187000 dollars to its foreign customer with reference to gst law whether company is liable to pay igst or cgst and sgst definitely my dear friends what will come is cgst and sgst because location of supplier and place of supply both are in same state if the location of supplier and place of supply both are in same state then what will come is cgst and sgst but not igst igst will come only if the supply is an interstate supply and a supply is regarded as interstate supply only if location of supplier and place of supply both are in different state but if location of supplier and place of supply both are in same state we call it as intrastate supply and for intrastate supply we will charge cgst and sgst but not igst getting clarity friends very very interesting and wonderful concept actually clear in fact i remember very clearly that this kind of question came already before my dear friends agreed riyan good next see it answer the following with reference to provisions of 
Customs Act and the rules made there under. Very good. See now. Sudhakar filed a claim for payment of duty drawback amounting to 61,500 on 23rd July. However, amount was received on 21st October. You are required to calculate amount of interest payable to Sudhakar. So let me tell you, when we talk about interest on drawback, we have got one wonderful section called section 75A, which talks about interest on drawback, which clearly says that when you apply for drawback, drawback is always to be given within one month. If the drawback is not given within one month, then they will pay interest at the rate of 6% per annum. 6% per annum, that's it. When did you apply? We applied on 23rd July. So, it should have come on which date? 24th August. Come on, my dear friends. Please look at here. First of it. Drawback applied on. Drawback applied on. 23rd July. Next. As per section 75A, if drawback is not paid, if drawback is not paid within one month to the claimant, then interest at the rate of 6% is payable. And of course, 6% is what my dear friends? Per annum. 6% per annum is paid by government. So getting clarity my dear friends? So how much government will pay? 6% per annum. Now if you observe, drawback is given on, come on friends, drawback is given on which day? Drawback is given on 21st October. Drawback is given on 21st October. Come on. Drawback is given on 21st October, my dear friends. As I told you very clearly, whenever they apply for drawback, they will always give drawback within one month. And if they do not give drawback within one month, interest will be paid at the rate of 6% per annum. And interest will start from expiry of one month. Therefore, interest is equal to, what is the figure by the way? The figure is 61,500 into 6% into how many days my dear friends? How many days is? I will calculate from 24th August to 21st October. That means what? August how many days? August 31, right? So 7 days in August and uh, 30 days in September. 21 days in October. 7 plus 30 plus 21. It comes to how many days, my dear friends? 24th August, right? August is 31 days actually. So August is 31 days. 31 days means what? 24 to 31. Exactly. So it becomes 8 days, my dear friends. 8 days in August. Because for 24th also we will calculate interest. 8 days. 8 plus 30 plus 21 comes to 59 days. 59 days divided by 365. We will always calculate on day basis because interest rate is given as per annum. 61,500 into 6% into 59 divided by 365. So figure will come to 596.46. I will take it as just 596. So interest what we will get on drawback is 596. Very interesting point. Come on friends. Second bit. Lalit was erroneously refunded a sum of 27,000 in excess of actual drawback on 16th June. You got more than what you are supposed to receive. When you got more than what you are supposed to receive, then give back to the government. How can you keep that with you? A demand for recovery of the same was issued by the department on 24th August. And Lalit refunded the amount on 16th October. Interest will come till 16th October. 
and that too my dear friends interest is payable at the rate of not 18 15% per annum 18% is in gst so when we have to pay we have to pay 15% per annum when they are paying they will pay 6% per annum so friends if you see very clearly date of erroneous refund is 16th june which is paid back on which is paid back on 16th october correct my dear friends when they gave notice is not important from when you got it and when you paid back till that period we will calculate interest correct or not paid back on 16th october therefore interest under section 75a at the rate of 15 percent per annum would be levied from 17th june to 16th october 17th june to 16th october because on 16th interest will not come but from 17th interest will start june how many days then 14 days in june 31 days in july 31 days in august 30 days in september 16 days in october so what is happening here my dear friends 30 30 30 90 92 92 30 is 122 days 122 days of delay is there and what is the interest will calculate is that what is the figure by the way figure is 27000 into 15% into 122 divided by 365 27000 into 27000 into 15% into 122 divided by 365 interest comes to 1353.69 so i'll take it as 1354 1354 that is the interest in fact a wonderful question a fantastic question and a high possibility is there this kind of question can come in the exam which has got some brilliant concept in this my dear friends are we clear with this very good that's the end of story for third question my dear friends come on come on my dear friends we are done with question number 3 now let's look at question number 4 my dear friends come on please look at that kindly please concentrate my dear friends and focus when something is going on for a purpose let's fulfill that purpose so kindly please concentrate come on prakriti enterprises a sole proprietorship firm started an ac restaurant in indore madhya pradesh in the month of january wherein customers are served cooked food as well as cool drinks or non alcoholic beverages very good in february month what has happened firm opened a liquor shop in dehradun uttarakhand for trading in alcoholic liquor for human consumption determine whether prakriti enterprises is liable to be registered under gst with the help of following information so first of all if you observe very carefully they are doing business in madhya pradesh and they are doing business in uttarakhand so both of them are not regarded as special category states for the purpose of registration because for the purpose of registration only four states are regarded as special category states and the four states are manipur mizoram nagaland and tripura clear friends wherein if any person is engaged in providing if any person is engaged in providing taxable supplies in manipur mizoram nagaland and tripura then registration is mandatory if aggregate turnover exceeds 10 lakhs if not it is 20 lakhs and one special point is there 40 lakhs also if you are engaged exclusively in supply of goods that too in some special states now you see here prakriti enterprises is a sole proprietorship firm started an ac restaurant restaurant means what service so it is service which is not in manipur mizoram nagaland tripura then registration is mandatory only if aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs come on my dear friends look at that question my dear friends we are looking at fourth question a bit
First line, come on. As per section 22, registration is mandatory. As per section 22, registration is mandatory. Registration is mandatory if aggregate turnover. Come on, my dear friends, what turnover, sir? Aggregate turnover. I repeat one more time. If what turnover, my dear friends? If aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs, come on my dear friends, as per section 22, registration is mandatory only if aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs. An interesting point to be noted is that as per section 26, Aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies. Come on, my dear friends. Aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies, exempt supplies. Aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies, exempt supplies, interstate supplies, and exports on all India basis. On all India basis under same pan. Come on, my dear friends. Very, very interesting language. Reload that once again. Come on. As per section 26, as per section 26, aggregate turnover. I already told this so many times, but again I'm telling because it's extremely important. Very, very important definition. Clear? Come on. As per section 26, aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies, exempt supplies interstate supplies and exports on all India basis under the same pan. However, next line, aggregate turnover does not include, aggregate turnover does not include value of inward supplies on which recipient is aggregate turnover does not include what my dear friends value of invert supplies on which recipient is liable to pay tax under RCM come on my dear friends which section are talking sir as per section 26 aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies exempt supplies interstate supplies and exports on all india basis under same pan however aggregate turnover does not include value of invert supplies on which recipient is liable to pay tax under rcm getting clarity friends now one special point which you should know very clearly is that as per section 247, exempt supplies means, exempt supply means those supplies, exempt supply means those supplies which are exempt under GST law. Exempt supply means those supply which are exempt under GST law and also includes non-taxable supply. This word is very, very important and includes what my dear friends? Non-taxable supply. Now, as per section 278, non-taxable supply As per section 278, my dear friends, non-taxable supply means those supply which are not leviable to tax, which are not leviable to tax under GST. Come on, my dear friends, non-taxable supply means those supply which are not liable to tax under GST. This much points, why did I write? 
there is a reason because they are extremely important always keep in mind whenever question is coming in exam on registration whether is liable to be registered or not you should definitely write all these points in exam your presentation only will make the whole difference and aggregate turnover covers all taxable supplies exam supplies interest rate supplies and exports on all india basis under same pan but aggregate turnover does not include value of invoice supplies on which recipient is liable to pay tax under rcm an interesting point to be noted is that as per section 247 exempt supplies means those supplies which are exempt under gst law and also includes non taxable supply and as per section 278 non taxable supplies means those supply which are not liable to tax under gst that means what classic example all colic liquor for human consumption and that five petroleum products which have been temporarily kept outside gst on those gst will not apply they are called as non taxable supply however for the purpose of calculating aggregate turnover they are included because of a simple reason and fact that aggregate turnover also includes exempt supply and exempt supply also includes non taxable supply so turnover of alcohol liquor for human consumption and also turnover of that five petroleum products are included for the purpose of determining the requirement of getting registration done see now going back to the question in january month what is the story guys cooked food and cool drinks non alcohol beverages served in restaurant in madhya pradesh 6 lakh 16000 Interest received from bank on fixed deposit. This is exempt, my dear friends. But even though it is exempt, still it is considered for calculating aggregate turnover. Then, packed food items supplied from Mr. and Madhya Pradesh. Total figure how much, guys? Six sixteen plus one one two plus one sixty eight. Six sixteen plus one one two plus one sixty eight. Total is eight ninety six. Eight lakhs ninety-six thousand. So registration is not required in the month of February, but January. I mean to say, in January month, January is only eight lakh ninety-six thousand. So registration is not required. But February, if you see, seven twenty will consider. Five sixty also will consider because alcohol liquor for human consumption is a non-taxable supply. Non-taxable supply is covered in exempt supply, and exempt supply is covered in aggregate turnover. Seven twenty-eight. 560 112 224 728 this comes to 16 lakhs 24000 16 lakh 24000 and already we have done how much friends 8 lakh 96000 16 24000 8 lakh 96000 total is coming to 25 lakhs 20000 what my dear friends total is 25 lakhs 20000 that means registration is not required in the month of january but registration is required in the month of february and more over interesting point is that we have to apply for registration within 30 days we have to apply for registration within 30 days from the date we are liable to be registered getting clarity friends we have to apply for registration within 30 days from the date we are liable very very interesting point make sense right speak out very good come on come on looking at the second bit my dear friends bhumika caretaker caretakers very good bhumika caretakers a registered person provides the service of repair and maintenance of electrical appliances very good on april 1st it has entered into an annual maintenance contract with navin for its ac and washing machine so whenever we talk about an annual maintenance contract we will call it as continuous supply of service because we have got one wonderful section called section 233 which defines what is continuous supply of service which clearly says that a service is regarded as continuous supply of service if it is provided under a contract on recurring basis for a period more than 3 months if it is provided under a contract if it is provided under a contract 
on recurring basis for a period more than three months. Then we will call that service as continuous supply of service. I repeat one more time my dear friends, if a service is provided on recurring basis under a contract for a period more than three months, then we will call that service as continuous supply of service. Here, since it is annual maintenance contract, since it is annual maintenance contract that is obviously for more than three months, we will call it as continuous supply of service. Next line. As per the terms of the contract, maintenance services will be provided in the, on the first day of each quarter of the relevant financial year and payment for the same will also be due on the date on which service is provided during the year. It provided service on April 1st, July 1st, October 1st, Jan 1st in accordance with terms of the contract. When should Bhumika caretakers issue the invoice for services rendered? For this, my dear friends, we have got a wonderful section called Section 31, my dear friends, which clearly says that in case of continuous supply of service, in case of what, sir? Continuous supply of service. If the due date for payment is, if the due date for payment is ascertainable from the contract, if the due date for payment is what, sir? Ascertainable under a contract, then invoice must be issued on or before due date of payment. Here in this case, the due date is ascertainable from the contract. So invoice must be issued on or before April 1st, July 1st, October 1st, January 1st. That's it. Answer is over. But it is simple and easy, my dear friends. Getting clarity, guys? So when first in exam, what you have to present is that first line you have to present stating that it is a continuous supply of service because it is provided under a contract for a period more than three months. Next, after that what you will write is that as per section 31, in case of continuous supply of service where the due date for payment is ascertainable, invoice must be issued on or before due date of payment. In the given case, since due date for payment is ascertainable, invoice must be issued on or before April 1st, July 1st, October 1st and Jan 1st. That's it. They were the story of this wonderful problem, my dear friends. Are we clear? Good. Next. Be bit. Specify. Specify the amount of mandatory pre-deposit which should be made along with every appeal before appellate authority and appellate tribunal. Does making a pre-deposit have an impact on recovery proceedings? If you make the pre-deposit, then the recovery proceedings will be stayed until disposal of appeal. Once you make the pre-deposit, they will not trouble you. They will not ask you to pay anything more unless appeal is finalized. And what is the pre-deposit you have to pay is, it depends upon appellate authority or other side appellate tribunal my dear friends for appellate authority come on friends kindly please listen for appellate authority pre-deposit what you will pay is 100% of admitted dues plus 10% of plus 10% of remaining tax in dispute. Come on, my dear friends. 100% of what, my dear friends? 100% admitted dues. When I say dues, it covers tax, interest, penalty, everything. Whatever is admitted. Whatever is admitted. Next, 10% of remaining tax in dispute. 10% of what my difference? Remaining tax in dispute. And let me tell you very clearly, this 10% of remaining tax in dispute, this 10% of remaining tax in dispute, 10% of remaining tax in dispute is restricted to maximum 25 crores. And this 25 crores language is given under CGST Act. SGST Act also they told 25 crores. So with IGST Act, 50 crores will come. Clear friends? And when we go to appellate tribunal, my dear friends, the pre-deposit what you have to pay is 100% of admitted dues. Now don't think, why you pay us again and again? 
100 per cent admitted dues what you paid already was as per order of adjudicating authority now when we go to tribunal 100 per cent of admitted dues is as per order of appellate authority difference is there don't think we are paying double never will pay double plus 20 per cent of remaining tax in dispute <clears throat> 20% of remaining tax in dispute and let me tell you one line my dear friends this 20% is in addition to 10% this 20% is in addition to what sir 10% just to because we pay 10% doesn't mean you will tell that i will pay balance 10% now it's not like that this 20% is in addition to 10% what is already paid this 20% is in addition to 10% what is already paid and let me tell you an interesting line this 20% is restricted to this 20% is restricted to maximum 50 crores 50 crores is given by cgst act sgst act also they give 50 crores so with igst act it becomes 100 crores my dear friends that's the point are you getting clarity guys and this point is given by section 107 and this point is given by section 112 107 talks about appeal to appellate authority 112 talks about appeal to appellate tribunal i hope we got full clarity on this point speak out my dear friends very interesting and very wonderful point actually next moving forward mr ayer an indian entrepreneur what has happened to him come on he went to london to explore new business opportunities on 7 4 2016 his wife also joined him joined him in london after 6 months you have to observe that word after 6 months then what has happened following details are submitted by them with customs authorities on their return to india on 21st april 2017 that means you have to observe that mr ayer stayed abroad for more than one year whereas mrs ayer stayed for less than one year now one point which you all know very clearly is that if you stay for more than one year my dear friends what will happen my dear friends you will get the benefit of rule 5 i repeat one more time rule 5 benefit will come rule 5 benefit will come only to those who stay abroad for more than one year and rule 5 benefit is basically jewelry allowance and jewelry allowance is basically my dear friends 20 grams with 20 grams with value cap of 50000 i repeat one more time my dear friends 20 grams with value cap of 50000 that is in case of gentleman for lady it is 40 grams value cap 1 lakh i repeat one more time my dear friends for gentleman it is 20 grams value cap 50000 but for lady it is 40 grams value cap 1 lakh see now what they have brought used personal effects this anyways not dutiable then two music systems each worth 50000 so under rule 3 we can tell we can tell what my dear friends no duty because rule 3 talks about the concept of general duty free allowance general duty free allowance for an indian resident or foreigner residing in india or a tourist of any origin they will get an exemption of used personal effect and travel souvenirs and also articles up to a value of 50000 50000 if you come from nepal bhutan myanmar it is 15000 15000 it is different but generally it is 50050 next jewelry brought by mr ayer 49500 on this no duty because of rule 5 he can happily enjoy the benefit of rule 5 but jewelry brought by wife is 97500 on this duty word apply and let me tell you very clearly my dear friends the rate of duty for baggage 
I repeat one more time, my dear friends, the rate of duty for baggage is straight away 38.5%. 35% is the basic rate plus 10% social welfare surcharge. Effectively, it comes to 38.5%. Clear, my dear friends? The jewelry allowance benefit wife cannot avail because she stayed abroad for less than one year. Jewelry allowance benefit will come only for those who stay abroad for more than one year. If somebody stays abroad for less than one year, they will not get the benefit of Rule 5. And moreover, you have to observe that for Mrs. Iyer, Rule 3 benefit is already over because Rule 3 benefit is only 50,000 and music system is already 50,000. So gone. So for this jewelry of 97,500, she cannot avail any other benefit and straight away she will be dutiable on this 97,500 at the rate of 38.5%. 35% is a basic rate, 10% social welfare surcharge, effectively 38.5%. Clear friends? That's it. I already discussed a lot of questions on baggage rules. And let me tell you very clearly, baggage rules is one such topic where possibility of question coming in exam is very high. No games at all. Clear? Let's proceed. Question number 5. Come on my dear friends. See that? Ishika started, Ishika started supply of goods in Jaipur, Rajasthan on 5-1. Her turnover exceeded 20 lakhs on 23rd January. However, she didn't apply for registration. Now, one point is very clear, my dear friends. Generally, if it is only supply of goods, if it is exclusively in supply of goods, that too intrastate for Rajasthan, the limit is actually 40 lakhs. But here they did not give clarity whether it is intrastate or interstate. What else is there? Clear? So we'll assume that it is 20 lakhs only. See now, however, she didn't apply for registration. Determine the amount of penalty that may be imposed on Ishika on 31st March. If the tax evaded by her as on set date on account of failure to obtain registration is 5 lakh 32, 33,000. You can also write one note stating that if a person is engaged exclusively in supply of goods in the state of Rajasthan, then limit is 40 lakhs, limit is not 20 lakhs. But here, there is no clarity whether it is exclusively in intrastate or not, clarity is not there. So we'll treat it as 20 lakhs only. In that case, what will happen? We have got one section called 122.1, which clearly says, penalty will be tax evaded or 10,000 whichever is higher my dear friends come on sir penalty will be what sir tax evaded or 10,000 whichever is higher I repeat one more time my dear friends how much is the penalty my dear friends tax evaded whatever tax has been evaded or 10,000 whichever is higher not lower here a tax evaded is 5,33,000. So automatically penalty will be equal to 5,33,000. Getting clarity guys? Good. Next line. Madhusudan, Managing Director of Quants Course Technologies Limited is issued a summon. Please observe that word. He is given a summon to appear before what my reference? Central Tax Officer to produce books of accounts of Quants Core Technologies Private Limited in an inquiry conducted on said company, determine the amount of penalty, if any, that may be imposed on Madhusudan if he fails to appear before central tax officer. So let me tell you, in case of failure to appear before officer on being summoned, we have got one section called 122.3, which says that penalty is up to 25,000. Penalty is what, my dear friends? Up to 25,000. 122.3 has got one point which says that if any person on account of, if any person on account of failure to appear before central tax officer, he will be liable to penalty and penalty may extend up to 25,000. Getting clarity, friends? Speak out. Wonderful. Next slide. Hariharan has filed an appeal before appellate authority against order of what my difference against order of appellate authority where the issue involved is place of supply and the order of appellate tribunal is also in favor of departments Hariharan 
now wants to file appeal against the decision of appellate authority as he feels the stand taken by him is correct you are required to advise him suitably with regards to filing of an appeal before appellate forum higher than tribunal so one point you have to understand very clearly is that when order is when order is passed by appellate authority when order is passed by what sir appellate authority and the person intends to file appeal before who my dear friends appellate tribunal then then he must file appeal before national bench or regional bench he must file appeal before whom sir national bench or regional bench national bench or regional bench since issue is related to place of supply i repeat one more time my dear friends if there is any matter related to place of supply then appeal is always filed before national bench or regional bench and if there is no matter related to place of supply we will go and file appeal before state bench or area bench correct my dear friends now listen any person agreed i did not say agreed it is agreed agreed means what dissatisfied any person agreed by the order of any person agreed by order of national bench or regional bench can file appeal to supreme court let me tell you very clearly he will not file appeal before high court but he will directly file appeal before supreme court my dear friends that is why what we always say is that when we talk about when we talk about appellate authority from appellate authority we will go and file appeal before whom sir appellate tribunal and in tribunal there is somebody called national bench or regional bench other one is called state bench or area bench and if there is a matter related to place of supply we will go to national bench or regional bench if there is no matter related to place of supply we will go to state bench or area bench from state bench or area bench we can go to high court from high court we will go to supreme court but when we talk about national bench or regional bench from here from national bench or regional bench i repeat one more time from national bench or regional bench directly we will file appeal before supreme court only we will not go to high court so i repeat one more time my dear friends carefully please listen sir and concentrate listen if there is any matter if there is any matter related to place of supply then appeal is filed before national bench or regional bench and from national bench or regional bench will directly file appeal before supreme court and if there is no place of supply matter i repeat one more time if there is no place of supply matter we will file appeal before state bench or area bench and from state bench or area bench we can go to high court and then we'll go to supreme court that is the wonderful point what is your clarity upon clear my difference speak out this point i believe came before also and very interesting and important make sense right wonderful going back to the paper come on explains provisions regarding come on my dear friends please see that explain provisions regarding period of retention of accounts sir so generally accounts have to be retained for a period of 72 months from due date of filing annual return 72 months from what my dear friends due date of filing annual return friends i repeat one more time my dear friends in general in general books of account should be retained for a period of 72 months from due date of filing annual return but 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 if any appeal 
or if any proceedings or any inquiry or investigation is going on then books of accounts have to be retained for a period of 72 months from due date of filing annual return or one year or one year after disposal of appeal whichever is later i repeat one more time friends kindly please concentrate in general books of accounts should be retained for a period of 72 months from due date of filing annual return however if the person is a party to an appeal or any scrutiny or proceedings or investigation then books should be maintained for a period of i mean to say retained for a period of 72 months from due date of filing annual return or one year or how much time sir one year after disposal of appeal whichever is later they did not tell earlier they told whichever is later my dear friends getting clarity next slide with reference to cgst act explain what my dear friends explain the liability of directors of private company so let me tell you we have got wonderful section called section 89 come on my dear friends which section my dear friends section 89 which says very clearly that Come on, my dear friends, kindly please concentrate. Section 89 very clearly says that in case of a private company, all the directors, all the directors are jointly and severally liable. I repeat one more time. In case of a private company, all the directors are jointly and severally liable. However, if directors prove that, if directors prove that there is no gross negligence, there is no gross negligence or misfeasance or breach of duty on their part then directors shall not be liable i repeat one more time my dear friends section 89 clearly says that in case of in case of a private company if any amount is due then all the directors are jointly and severally liable all directors are jointly and severally liable however directors shall not be liable if they prove that there is no gross negligence or misfeasance or breach of duty on their part so if they prove that there is no gross negligence or misfeasance or breach of duty on their part then they are not liable getting clarity friends done that is the story of b bit my dear friends clear come on now c bit my dear friends explain elaborate the difference between transit and transshipment of goods what a lovely concept guys first of all let me tell you this concept of transit is dealt by section 53 my dear friends transshipment is dealt by section 54 and the important point to be noted very clearly is that in case of transit goods are allowed to remain on board conveyance see for example goods are coming from us to india and from india goods are going to australia i repeat one more time goods have come from us to india and the goods are going to australia and the same conveyance is going just like that. I repeat one more time. One vessel has come from US to India. And goods are there in the vessel only. And the same vessel is going to Australia. That is called as transit. But when we talk about transshipment. Transshipment is a case where conveyance is changed. That means when goods have come from US to India. Goods are unloaded. Goods are unloaded. And again reloaded onto a different conveyance unloaded and reloaded onto a different commence an interesting point to be kept in mind is that in case of a transit there is a continuity of records because vessel did not change but in case of transshipment there is no continuity of records because commence has changed that's it write points like this you will get your marks clear friends very interesting and wonderful make sense right so clarify once again my dear friends transit is dealt by section 53 Transshipment is dealt by 54. In case of a transit, goods are goods remain on board the conveyance. Whereas in transshipment, goods are unloaded and reloaded onto other conveyance. Next difference is that in transit, there is a continuity of records because conveyance did not change. But whereas in transshipment, there is no continuity of records because conveyance has changed. Clear my difference? That's it. That is the story of question number 5. Come on, my dear friends, let's look at the last question in this particular paper. That is the sixth question. See that, come on. Discuss the provisions of return GSTR 3B as contained in subrule 5 and subrule 6 of section 61 of CGST rules. So let me tell you very clearly that GSTR 3B, 
which form my difference GSTR 3B GSTR 3B is a monthly summary return GSTR 3B is a monthly summary return to be filed by normal registered person and why am I telling normal registered person because composition registered person will not file this GSTR 3B it is filed only by a normal registered person my dear friends and let me tell you very clearly that due date to file due date to file GSTR 3B is straight away 20th of next month 20th of which month my dear friends 20th of next month clear my dear friends an interesting point to be noted is that one wonderful point to be noted is something like this that GSTR 2 and GSTR 3 have been suspended originally in law there was a concept of GSTR 1, 2, 3 but 2 and 3 have been suspended and then GSTR 3B has been notified an interesting part you have to understand is that GSTR 3B which form my dear friends GSTR 3B captures the details of both outward supplies captures details of both outward supplies and inward supplies it captures details of both outward supplies and inward supply it is not just that we will show outward supplies we will show outward supplies also inward supplies also getting clarity my dear friends speak out sir wonderful that is interesting points what you have to observe very clearly sir that's it that is the story of this particular question and just to add on what are the point you can add on is that there is no need to submit invoice wise details there is no need to submit what my dear friends invoice wise details and that is the reason why we call this return as a summary return where straight away we will show the details of outward supplies and inward supplies show the net liability paid to the government that's it in fact originally the plan of the government was different GSTR 1, 2, 3 and all but altogether final output became altogether different like how in life we think expectation and reality how much difference is there like that it happened clear come on GST was supposed to be good and simple tax but the way it has become has been very crazy come on what is the time limit for issuance of what my dear friends show cause notice under section 73 and 74 come on 73 what is the time limit guys 73 time limit is 2 years 9 months and 74 time limit is 4 years 6 months correct my difference come on to clarify that point further so when we talk about section 73 73 is what recovery in cases other than FMS and 74 Section 74 talks about FMS and FMS stands for fraud, misstatement and suppression and for other than FMS they told time limit for notices time limit for issuance of show cause notices 2 years 9 months from due date of filing annual return 2 years 9 months from what my reference due date of filing annual return for the financial year to which demand pertains and we all know the story of what we are trying to do in 73 and 74 73 74 talks about determination of tax not paid or short paid or ITC wrongly availed or utilized or refund claimed erroneously refund claim how my dear friends erroneously and in section 74 let me tell you my dear friends time limit 
for issuance of show cause notices four years six months from due date of filing from due date of filing annual return for financial year to which demand pertains same logic but the difference is that in 73 case it is 2 years 9 months 74 case it is 4 years 6 months i believe we got full clarity on this point that's it already we discussed this kind of question so many times then going back explain the recourse to be taken by the officer in case where proper explanation is not furnished proper explanation is not furnished for the discrepancy for the discrepancy detected in what my dear friends return filed now the point is very clear my dear friends when we talk about scrutiny under section 61 PO will give a notice and will give a time limit of 30 days to reply and if the reply is not satisfactory I repeat one more time if reply is not satisfactory or reply is satisfactory but discrepancies are not being accepted then proper officer can take recourse under section 65 or 66 or 67 or 73 or 74 now what is the meaning of these words it's important sir 65 talks about something called department audit where they give a notice at least 15 days prior to conduct an audit they'll come and conduct an audit and they'll complete within three months further extended by six months and 66 talks about special audit where they appoint one chartered accountant or cost accountant and ask him to go and conduct the audit and come back. 67 talks about power of inspection, search and seizure. They can do inspection, search and what my difference? Seizure. And 73 talks about recovery in case of other than FMS 74 talks about recovery in case of FMS so one point very clear is that the notice is given reply should be given within 30 days but within 30 days if there is no satisfactory explanation given then proper officer can proceed under section 65 or 66 or 67 or 73 or 74 65 is what department audit 66 is what special audit to be conducted by chartered accountant or cost accountant nominated by commissioner 67 talks about inspection search and seizure 73 is recovery in case of other than fms and 74 recovery in case of fms getting clarity friends that's it finally the last bit c bit and the last question what will be the impact on customs duty if the goods are damaged inside warehouse sir if they are damaged inside warehouse my dear friends you can claim something called abatement under one wonderful section called section 22 my dear friends and let me tell you abatement is like a parcel exemption where you will pay the duty based on the value of the goods after damage that means if the value of the goods before damage is 1 lakh and the value of the goods after damage is 70,000 then we will pay the duty only on 70,000 proportionately we will pay the duty that's why it's called as abatement abatement is something like partial exemption then destroyed in the warehouse so if it's destroyed we will go for something called section 23 where we will ask for remission of duty remission is something like waiver we will ask for a waiver of duty on goods lost or goods destroyed getting clarity friends as per section 23 we can ask for remission of duty on goods lost or destroyed and one point you have to understand is that pilferage is different lost or destroyed is different pilferage is because of a human act but destroyed may not be on account of a human act getting clarity friends and destroyed means what goods are gone that's why we ask for remission of duty and remission stands for waiver of duty then destroyed on the wharf here also same concept we will apply section 23 and ask for remission of duty sir wharf is something like a place or a platform where goods are unloaded 
generally when we go outside for boating or something like that we realize that there is a level platform where they pull this pull the boat or pull the ship and tie that that is called as a wharf that is like a plank or a platform where the goods are unloaded first clear my dear friends speak out sir and one point always keep in mind my dear friends when we talk about section 73 or 74 i mean to say when we talk about destroyed in the warehouse or destroyed on the wharf the interesting point to be noted is that such loss or a destruction i repeat one more time such loss or a destruction such loss or destruction must be proved such loss or destruction must be proved to the satisfaction of ac or dc the assistant commissioner deputy commissioner such loss or destruction must be proved to the satisfaction of assistant commissioner deputy commissioner that's it very very interesting point my dear friends friends i strongly believe that we have got full clarity on all these points my dear friends very very interesting and extremely important points and i really want you guys to have a great clarity of thought on all these points for a simple reason and fact that shivateja and of course along with navkar digital institute our plan of action is very simple that if we discuss past exam rtps mtps past exam papers the level of clarity and the level of perfection will be very high and we go to the exam with the utmost level of confidence and as i told you in the first video itself very clearly that when we talk about this kind of activity being done for you the reason is very simple that if you have missed out clarity on any point that clarity should come now if clarity is already there perfection should come that's the whole idea clear friends that's it that is end of this wonderful paper clear the agenda for mock test paper of april 2018 thank you if you like this video share it with your friends subscribe to our youtube channel to watch more such videos and learn from our expert faculty members press the bell icon to get regular notifications whenever we upload a new video download ndi mobile app to get complete ca course online we value your support thank you for watching